Hello everyone. Welcome to the video edition, weekend edition of Traders Espresso for the week ending Friday, February 23rd, 2018. It was a, an up and down kind of a roller coaster week for equities. Uh, U.S. equities struggled most of the week. Sorry, I was a little distracted there by the um, the image that I was trying to show you. Let me pull back up again. So as I was saying, U.S. equities struggled most of the week. Uh, Tuesday, which was the first day of trading after the President's Day holiday, the S&P is what we're looking at here. The S&P gapped down, and it had a little bit of trouble in the morning, then it caught some strength around 9, 9.30, so just before we went to lunch. It rallied pretty hard into, the, into lunchtime, and then it kind of lost some steam after everybody comes back from lunch. A little bit of up and down, but overall it's basically you know selling uh, the second half of the day with a little bit of strength into the close, but still closing below the open, so still down for the day. All right, Wednesday, the S&P gapped up, and it showed some strength early in the morning. It kind of lost strength right around the lunch right around the lunch hour where everybody's going to lunch on the East Coast. Um, gets some strength after the Fed minutes come out, because remember, that's the day that the Fed minutes came out. This is Wednesday the 14th. Uh, is that right? No, not 14th. That's right, 21st. This was Wednesday when the Fed minutes came out. At first, the markets, you know, cheered the stocks, cheered that, and then once people started to really dig into the notes, the you know the minutes, and kind of understand what the implications were, equities started to sell off, and they sold, you know, pretty hard at right about here, and then accelerated into the close. All right, Thursday morning, equities gap up again, so we're starting to see this familiar pattern, gap up again. Uh, you know, pretty much rally the first half of the day, even even over the lunch hour, and then we're about halfway through the lunch hour, things starting to soften, and then you know, sell off here, a little bit of a rebound here, uh, but then you know, going into the close, not accelerated selling going into the close, but definitely some selling, you know, and again a down day overall, you know, closing down for the day. Friday was what saved this market and what. Uh, allowed me to be able to say that the equities were up on the week. Okay, basically gapping up, seeing a little bit of weakness, but basically able to maintain that bullishness until about 10 o'clock. A little bit of weakness. Everybody comes back from lunch, and it's and the S and P and the Dow and the Nasdaq and the Russell. They're just off to the races and they rallied pretty hard into the close for the day and for the week. So that's what sets the backdrop for last week coming into the current week. Let's take a look at fixed income for a second, okay? I talked about this before. You know, we had we saw the treasury you know auction off about 258 billion dollars worth of securities every single auction from the four week bills all the way up to the seven year note ended up with higher yields and I'm going to show you uh, a chart here which actually kind of amplifies that point or illustrates that point so every single auction showed us a higher yield from the auction before what we are seeing is not a lack of demand for treasuries there's still decent demand the point is that the federal government is going to be able to finance these burgeoning deficits but it's going to cost the feds in terms of you know cost of debt servicing investors will fund those deficits but at the right price. And what I mean by right price is it's going to have to be a low enough price. Conversely, they're going to have to get enough of a yield because lower prices mean higher yields. So it's going to cost the feds more to service this debt. 
Now, what's interesting is if we take a look at the yield curve, okay, the yield curve month to date doesn't really tell us a whole lot. I mean, in real terms, we see a little bit of steepening of the yield curve and in nominal terms as well. But what's probably most helpful is if we take a look at the year over year, okay? That last one that we were looking at was this last week versus the beginning of the month. This curve that we're looking at now is a year ago. So you can see that the current yield curve is not as steep as it was a year ago. And you can see that in both real and nominal terms. Now what's interesting is that we're not seeing where the steepening is occurring is not at the long end of the yield curve. It's occurring at the short end of the yield curve. So basically what that means is that investors, at least for the next, I don't know, three years, I mean, where do you want to make the cutoff? Definitely short term. In the short term, investors see some risk. They're demanding higher yields on the four week, uh, the 12 week, so on down the line. 24 week in the on the bills and the notes. So the concern about a yield curve which is flattening and even becomes inverted is that is what portends a recession. Now I don't I'm not saying that a recession is just around the corner. You know, there's some um, there's an article that I linked to in the written version of the blog. Basically Guggenheim Partners and Ray Dalio and a lot of other people are saying that you know, depending on how you put it, you know, Ray Dalio says that he sees there's a 75% chance of a recession by 2020. Guggenheim Partners is saying something like, we think that the, you know, this economic strength will last through to 2019. Glass is half full versus a glass is half empty kind of a view. If you want to be just really neutral about it, if yields are going to continue rising, which I think that they will, that's going to create extra costs for the federal government, for businesses, for consumers, and that could derail the economic recovery. It's not really a recovery anymore, it's economic growth. We're at full employment. With inflationary fiscal policy and with the tax cut and things of that nature, causing this economy to get even more heated than it is now, I understand Steve Mnuchin said, you know, this administration's fiscal policies are not going to are not going to lead to inflation, are not going to derail this, uh, the economic situation that we're in. I don't remember hearing any facts to back that up. All I know is what I'm looking at. And what I'm looking at tells me that that's looking at the world through, that kind of a view is really looking at the real world through rose-colored glasses, okay? If you want to have, you know, even more mixed signals, let's take a look at what commodities we're doing. With the exception of, um, like, palladium and natural gas and soybeans, most commodities were down on the week. And the one that we're going to look at specifically is copper. Because copper pricing is generally viewed as a barometer for the health of the global economy. And... This chart that we're looking at here shows copper from its peak in late December at 3.322 per pound, I think that is, until now. So copper's down about 4% from the peak, and last week it was also down 1%. All right? There's been a little bit of push-pull. But we see this, you know, this decline which occurred early in the year. Copper got a boost on the 24th, it looks like. Kind of treaded water for a little bit, then took a dive starting on the 7th. You know, had a little bit of a recovery, and now it's a little bit more push-pull. Where's copper going to go? Well, we'll see. Next week will be very telling in a lot of fronts. I think that the future of equities, let me take a step back. Next week is going to be a critical week for equities. And right now what we're looking at is, I would say, it's a tale of two indices. It is 
the strength of the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100 compared to the relative weakness of the Dow. And the Russell and the S&P are kind of in between. If we take a look at the NASDAQ 100, all right, we see a peak on December 26th of 7,033, call it, and then a decline all the way down to 6164 and change on the 9th of February, and then a rally hard from that point, okay? Rallied, the, nat the index rallied through key Fibonacci levels that rallied through the 38.2, stayed above it, in two trading days rallied above the 50, in one trading day rallied above the 61.8, which is another major retracement level, another major level, and then it kind of floated a little bit here for the next five trading days before it rallied hard and closed above the 73.6. That plus the fact that it is above all of its moving averages, uh, the 10, the 20, the 50, the 100, and the 200, which you can barely see here at the bottom, it's well extended above the 200. The 10 period, or the 10 day moving average has crossed above the 50. It's within striking distance of crossing above the 20. I would say that, at least for the short term, the NASDAQ composite and the 100 are very well poised to retake their highs. Now, what happens when they hit that point? It's anybody's guess. But I think we've got a clear shot up to those highs over the course of the next week. If we take a look at the Dow, the Dow is telling a very different story. This is not a story of strength. It's not a story of weakness necessarily, but it relative, it, it's definitely not a story of relative strength. You know, the Dow hit its high on the 26th, 26, uh, 6, 17 call it, traded down until it hit the low on the 9th of 23, 360, and it's rallied since that point, okay? It struggled with the 38.2. It, it hit that point, then it closed above it, so it did manage to do that. It broke through the 50, flirted with crossing above the 61.8, but didn't close above it. It crossed above it, but didn't close. Then it struggled crossing below this 50, till it was finally able to cross back above the 50 on, fri on this last Friday, which is where we saw that huge rally. So it's not even above the 61.8. Whether or not it can close and stay above the 61.8 is doubtful. It's definitely not as strong of a case as it is for the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100. In addition to that, we see, we don't see the strength above moving averages like we saw with the NDX. We see a, a Dow, which is kind of treading water between the 50 and the 10, between the 50 and the 200, or the 100, okay? It was able to close on Friday above the 50, above the 20. It was already above the 10. The 10 is the only moving average that's provided any kind of support whatsoever. So I think that this is a story of relative weakness. You know, it's not a story of relative strength. I'm not saying that the Dow is weak, but of those indices, I think it is the weakness. Now, this is some content that is not in the written blog. Um, I'm going to take you through it because I was looking at the put call ratios for each of the ETFs that track the major indices. And what I found was very interesting. If we start with the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100 ETF, the put call ratio, so just so that you know, put call ratio is the number of puts versus the number of calls. Number of puts is divided into the number of but the number of calls divided into the number of puts, and that gives you a ratio. Anything below 0.75 is considered bullish. Anything between 0.75 and 1, and 1 is considered neutral, and anything above 1 is considered bearish. So if we believe the put-call ratio, investors are bearish on the Qs. Investors are neutral on the diamonds, which is the Dow, the ETF that tracks the Dow 30, because it's between, it's just shy of one. 
investors are bearish on the spider which is the S&P 500 ETF it's at 1.4 and investors are the most bearish on the IWM which is the ETF that tracks the Russell 2000 2.5 that is incredibly bearish especially when you compare it to the other indices now for some other content that we're not going to see uh, in the written version I also want to take a look at stochastics the stochastic histogram which is the bottom uh, indicator here as well as the stochastics themselves okay the stochastics on a on a day chart look bearish we're seeing increasing stochastics here all right we're seeing bullish uh, bearish stochastics with a bullish tilt on the week the month stochastic histogram does not tell a good story at all now understand that bar on the stochastic histogram is still forming okay because it's for the month the month of february we still have monday tuesday and wednesday for that bar to complete so take a look at what that bar does on wednesday how does it close on wednesday that's going to set the tone i think for the remainder of uh possibly the remainder of the year if not the, the next three months if we go backwards and take a look at the spiders same story bullish on the day chart bearish on the week chart but with a bullish tilt bearish on the on the year chart or the month I'm sorry the month chart each bar represents a month so put differently this month actually traded below the range of January it has not closed below that range this is the where it's closed as of Friday so it's about halfway uh, on the candle anyway if the spider if the spider is able to close whether it's this month or in March if it closes below this candle the low of this candle that is not bullish at all that is in fact bearish looking at the cues The cues right now are showing on the month chart are showing the most strength because we don't even see a bearish histogram forming, but we do see declining, deteriorating momentum. All right. If we zoom in and we take a look at this candle here, this is a doji. So we see a really long wick. We see virtually no candle body whatsoever. All right, it's traded this month all the way down to here below the low of January and it's traded back all the way up here, okay? So it'll be interesting to see what the queues do in the following week to close out the month. My guess is that we'll probably see this candle form and then we'll see a uh, what they call in an, uh, not an inverted hammer but a hanging man which is usually a bearish sign. I don't know if that's technically truly a hanging man because it would have to be actually above the high here but that would be a pretty strong if it does form something like that that would be potentially a strong reversal signal and then finally the diamonds which is the Dow 30 same things we saw in the Russell same things we saw in the S&P we see bullish day chart we see a bearish with a bullish tilt on the week chart we see potentially a bearish month chart we see a, a bearish histogram forming here we see a candle a wick which traded all the way down here well below the lows of january but has since recovered all right it'll be interesting to see what happens over the remainder of the month if this closes you know close to the bottom here or if it closes below you know, that would be potentially a fairly bearish signal. So 
And what do we take from all of this? If you're a short-term trader, I would say that you're probably pretty good if you're exposed to the NASDAQ. Uh, larger NASDAQ names, anything the NASDAQ 100, if you're exposed to the Qs themselves, if you're long, uh, you're in good shape. I don't know. I think you'll be taking a risk if you initiate any new exposure. Uh, I definitely think that you're uh, generating, you know, initiating any new exposure in the Russell, any components of the Russell, in the S&P or the Dow, you know, you, uh, you're doing it, you're taking a risk when you do that. It'll be very interesting to see how this month and how this coming week ends. I think that will tell us a lot, uh, at least we're hoping that it tells us a lot about what we can expect for March and, you know, for the remainder of at least going into the summer. So that's all, the, uh, all that I've got for this weekend's Traders Espresso. And I'll see you on the live stream on, stream on Monday morning. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks.